Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, with partisan rancor at historic levels, our panel discusses the need to engage in civil discourse. What role has social media played in adding to our contentious political climate? How can we participate in robust political debate with an open mind? And what are the consequences if we don't find a path out of our current state of incivility? Good evening and welcome to a special edition of the Hinckley Report. Tonight, we're going to talk about the need for civil discourse. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Joining our panel tonight, Rennell Anderson Jones, professor at the SJ Quinney College of Law at the University of Utah. Gary Herbert, former governor of Utah. And Boyd Matheson, host of Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Thank you all for being with us this evening. Such an important topic. This is our Thanksgiving holiday. People are at their homes, they're gathering with family, they're gathering with friends. And sometimes we talk about how we shouldn't bring up the, the issue of politics. And, and I wanna talk about that for a minute tonight because it's such an important conversation to have, not just about what's happening in politics, but where we go from here. How do we continue to have these important conversations in the places that matter? I wanna start with you, Governor Herbert. Uh, as an elected official, you've been in the middle of lots of issues on both sides of this. Talk about civility itself, where you've seen where it is and where do you, in the past and where it is now. Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Most people tell you it's getting worse. And uh, I think it kind of rises and falls based on issues and where you're at geographically. Uh, local government, I don't think there's as much rancor. Uh, uh, in Congress, there's a lot of rancor. And I think the stakes seem to be so high in Washington, D.C., playing who's king of the hill that it becomes a lot more emotional. And it's a win at all costs. And it's an us versus them. And them is always the enemy. Wow, boy, that's such an interesting commentary about what might have happened. I, I want to give you a couple kind of uh, polling results from place, places like the Washington Post that kind of sets the stage for exactly what Governor Herbert just said. Uh, this Washington Post poll, about 15% of adults say they have ended friendships over politics. Not just we don't talk anymore, we end friendships. 10% of Americans say they do not have a lot of friends on the other side of the political aisle. And people are also saying this is part of a Pew result uh, of their their poll that people don't just say they have differences in of political priorities. There's this discussion about whether or not we even share the same core American values. Yeah, and that's a that's the big part of the problem is we've gone beyond just talking about ideas, principles, and policies, uh, and now it's about people. It's become weaponized. We're attacking people. Uh, I think more than we have a political polarization problem in the country, we really have a contempt problem in the country, which is if we disagree on something politically you're worthless, you're no good. And that way I can blow up your Facebook page, I can melt down your Twitter feed and I can still feel good about myself and go to church on Sunday uh, and feel real good about everything. And so it's this idea that it's the, the people are worthless because they're different than I am. So I don't have them as friends, so I can attack them. Uh, and, and that actually feeds into something really interesting, Jason, in terms of uh, disinformation and misinformation. So if, if you're a Ute fan and Governor Gary here is, uh, is a BYU fan and he hates the Utes, he's going to be much more inclined to believe mm. bad things about you as a Ute. Uh, and so he might get some misinformation, he might get some disinformation, but because you're not worth it, because you disagree, because mm. you're a Ute fan and he's a Cougar fan, uh, that's part of the problem. And we've got to get it back to the, the people, the principles and the policies we can have great debates about. Let me just make sure that everybody knows I'm very ecumenical. I'm <laughs> okay, go ahead. Just, just, just this is how rumors get started. People go up and I just say, well, I'm a former governor, you know. <laughs> so it, it's true. I, we, in fact, do look for something that allows us to feel better or superior than the other side. And unfortunately, that takes it to levels of personality, uh, personal attacks. And it is, I, I like what Boyd said, it's contempt 
we have a contempt for your points of view and that justifies whatever I need to do now to win the fight and the argument. Uh, Rennell, bring a couple of these points back together. You're, I, I know you're, you're an expert on First Amendment. You're an expert on what's happening in, in social media itself. Talk about that line of contempt as it does relate to, I think it's an important conversation, uh, misinformation uh, versus disinformation, because we can find all of that, particularly online. Yeah, a big piece of what's happening in the social media sphere is that social media platforms and their algorithms uh, uh, are designed uh, to generate interaction and engagement. And often that engagement they found most come, is sort of most likely to come about when people are in a state of fear or are in a state of anger. And so uh, it, algorithmically we're being programmed uh, to click and like and engage with material that is extreme. And so uh, part of what's happening here that um, that both of these folks were just mentioning is that um, our tendency to vilify folks on the other side of the political spectrum may be amplified by the fact that our exposure to folks on the other side of the political spectrum is being curated through this very strange lens, a lens that suggests to us, that serves up to us uh, some of the most extreme um, examples from that other side of the spectrum. So if um, if you're a Republican and the only uh, Democrats that you ever see in your feed are sort of curated uh, to anger you, or if you are a, um, a Democrat and all of the Republicans that show up uh, on your uh, on your Twitter feed are people who are the most extreme, who are saying the, uh, the um, most offensive, um, uh, most outrageous, principles and you generalize from that, then suddenly your sense of what all of those folks are like is um, is quite skewed and that um, that sort of vilification gets compounded. Yeah, I think it's so interesting. I love what Ronell has said in terms of that algorithm and how we just kind of get deeper and deeper into our own echo chambers and our own things. But there's also in the algorithms a rewarding of the extreme behavior because you will get more clicks, you will get more hits, you will get more campaign donations if you go to the extreme. Uh, Senator Ben Sass from uh, uh, from Nebraska described some of his colleagues as spending their days in what he called performative jackassery, <laughs> uh, just to make sure they could get one more click, one more like, one more hit on a, on a cable news network. And, and so that's part of the problem as well. So part of it is the algorithm problem. Part of it is what we keep clicking and digging deeper into our echo chambers. Well, I would add to that uh, cable television, the rise of cable television this last generation, 24 seven, advocating whatever their position may be. And so that reinforces the overgeneralization and the stereotypical aspect of whether you're Republican or Democrat, whatever it, uh, your party persuasion is. And they do it, why? Because it increases ratings. They get more people to watch. When you watch the cable uh, shows, they are controversial. They'll bring in somebody who's loud and, and, and uh, extreme because that's what people want to watch, that little kind of fight that goes on there. And they might be outnumbered. Republicans go to Fox Network. Uh, uh, Democrats go to MSNBC and they and they continually um, attack the other side unfairly. Mm -hmm. Rennell, it's it's interesting because um, I, I know you've seen this because most of us in these circles have. Every once in a while, you see a a media chart and it will have all the media stations on it, and uh, instead of just about them, it says where are they on the political spectrum, and you can just identify where they're going to come from their reporting based on their uh, their ideology and maybe even exactly what you all are talking about. Talk about what kind of impact that has because that's not necessarily always been the case. Uh, you're right, although it isn't the first time in American history in which we've had a distinctly partisan media, uh, but it certainly marks uh, a, a stark difference from what we had in, say, um, the 1960s and 1970s, in which journalistic norms were different and uh, in, in which uh, the uh, sort of the goal of being the Walter Cronkite, who was speaking to the whole nation on shared facts, um, might not uh, continue to exist. Part of the problem, I think, that we need to identify is that that chart that you've described is sort of en endeavored to be um, produced by um, sort of neutral, objective observers who are trying to chart where the media is, uh, isn't a chart that everyone would agree with. Right? We're sort of now at a point in which if you ask 
um, an average American uh, what um, they think is sort of the, the median um, uh, trustworthy journalistic organization, the organization that's playing it straight, the organization that's um, telling the truth and engaging in fact checking uh, might well align with their own political priors. And so as a matter of um, media literacy, I think we have some gaps where uh, folks sense of what neutral reporting on the facts looks like as compared to uh, reporting that you feel comfortable with, that you nod along with and say, yeah, you know, um, that was a really good report because it aligned with my own political priors. I think um, we're at a place now where there's a fairly significant divide amongst American media viewers on that front. So, Boyd, member of the media, you got a, a rebuttal of any sort here? <laughs> no, I'm just going to give a big amen to what <laughs> Ronell just said, uh, because it is, because what we, we want to hear a fair, uh, unbiased opinion as long as it validates my own, uh, and that's part of the problem. We have to be, I, one of the things that I fear most in our democracy is if we stop being curious. I know we never equate curiosity and freedom in the republic. Uh, I think curiosity is everything. Because if I'm so locked into what hearing only what I want to hear about whatever the issue is, and I stop listening to anything outside of that, uh, we have a real problem uh, in our constitutional republic. Uh, and so that willingness to be curious, to listen, even if you disagree, to be able to listen and not have to argue it, not have to have a tit for tat, talking points kind of thing, uh, but actually just listen. I had, a, uh, I had a guy on my radio program this week that was a socialist. Now, we disagreed on a lot of the policy issues for sure, but we didn't debate it. We listened, we talked, and we actually found, as we always find, that in things that really matter, they really matter to, to all Americans. They, they really do. And we can have that conversation. Uh, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs is, is a great example of this. He passed away about a year ago uh, in Great Britain. Uh, he once had a series of conversations with Amos Oz, world-renowned atheist. And people said, you know, wh why would you do that? He attacks everything you hold dear. Every principle you believe in, he attacks it. Uh, so they asked the rabbi, they said, Rabbi, what are you going to do? Go down there and convert him? And he said, no, I'm going to do something far more important. I'm going to listen to him. And they had a series of conversations around Great Britain that were absolutely fascinating and fabulous uh, because it was a listening experience, not an agreeing, but it was a real model in terms of how do you elevate that conversation. Uh, Governor, it's such an interesting point, and I, I don't want to take a little s aside of that, too, is the, it's the listening part and the understanding, but sometimes what happens because of what we just described is we stop talking about those key issues altogether. It's one thing to be listening. It's another thing when we feel like we can't even talk about the issues for fear of what might happen because we do. Well, sometimes we're so ready to put the argument out, we don't listen and hear what the opposition or the other side's point of view is going to be. I made it a point to meet with the Democrats once a week uh, when we're in legislative session to hear what their ideas were. You know, uh, nobody's got a pipeline, the Almighty, that's always right on every issue and every on every occasion. And uh, again, we found out that we're friends, and guess what? We found out we're all Utahns and we're all Americans. And that's the common thread we have. We probably have almost exactly the same goals and desired outcomes. We may differ on how we get there, what's the pathway to get from this point to that point to get the desired outcome. And that's okay, that's a healthy debate and discussion. But the fact that you have a different point of view or a different way to get there does not mean you're a bad person. And we forget, again, we're all on the same team. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we also forget that the original uh, founding fathers never envisioned you know, political parties. That's kind of tended to polarize. We found out shortly, if you can get a group of people to see your point of view, when we all glommed together, we got a little more power, and so parties were born. But the Founding Fathers envisioned us to be independent thinkers, uh, to represent the people the best we can, have our own ideas and what we'd put forward. Uh, but now we've, we've polarized so much, there's very little overlap. Boyd's been back in Congress, and, and if we had the House of Representatives, about 435 members that are there, we used to have about 125 overlap, meaning that the most liberal Republican was to the left of, of the most far-right Democrat, and there were about 125. So compromise was a part of the effort. Uh, Senate was the same way. Today it's about seven in the House and probably zero. You know, uh, <laughs> Joe Manchin may be yeah. the, the very zero point uh -huh. in the opposition. Between, so we don't have the overlap, and, and, and we forget the Founding Fathers, by the way, use compromise to get good results. Ronell, did you have a comment yeah, before I ask you I mean, a question? <laughs> I, 
I do. I, I think um, one of the things that we have to actually sort of squarely tussle with and tether our conversations to is the fact that um, notwithstanding the really admirable um, efforts on, on the part of folks like Governor Herbert to have that um, sort of one team mentality, the data um, today makes very clear that that is um, not the way that politics are operating. And in fact, that uh, most voters are motivated by loathing and hatred more than they are um, motivated by loyalty to a particular party or even to uh, loyalty to broader um, policy preferences or principles. That is, most people align themselves politically um, on the basis of some others, right? Um, they're looking out at, at sort of shared hatred for an outgroup rather than commitment to an affirmative agenda for an in-group. And there are massive consequences to a democracy for that kind of shift. And it, um, there are consequences that I think we probably should have some serious conversation about. I mean, one of the, the most significant of them is that what this means is that the, the tone with which we speak about the others stops to matter. We stop holding our own in-party um, uh, representatives uh, responsible for the tone that they take. And we also stop holding them responsible um, for sort of general principles of governmental accountability that we ordinarily presuppose in a democracy uh, at, the, at the ballot box. So if, um, if I voted for someone uh, purely because they have a shared hatred for uh, the other party, uh, they, um, they, uh, they share my enemy and um, they're angry in the same ways that I am, then um, there's some decent chance that I will not be motivated to hold them accountable if they are dishonest or incapable or inappropriate down the line, because their honesty and their capability uh, were not the reasons that I selected them. I selected them because they wanted to own this other side. Uh, and, and that's a real problem for uh, the sort of core principles that we think of in, as being in operation in a democracy. Uh, I think what, where Rennell's head is so important, I, I, I refer to it as the Dennis Rodman syndrome. Uh, Dennis Rodman was wild, crazy, you know, played for the Detroit Pistons, the bad boys. Everybody hated Dennis Rodman, and no one hated him more than the Chicago Bulls. They detested his hair, his antics, his dirty play, and they hated him right up to the point he became their Dennis Rodman. And then even though they didn't like his honesty, integrity, or a lot of the things that Rennell's pointing to, uh, they knew they were going to get rebound steals and, and wins as a result. And the same thing is happening in our politics, is that, yeah, they're horrible, they're terrible, they're awful, but they're my horrible, terrible, awful. And, and that's part of the problem. And then the other issue I think that Rennell's pointing out that's so important is that it's, as long as Congress can convince us that we're too divided to deal with health care or immigration, that keeps those in power in power. Uh, dictators, thugs, and bad guys have used division as a way to maintain power for centuries. Uh, it, gives a, it gives Congress an excuse to do nothing. It gives presidents of either political party the excuse to do things by executive order. Uh, and then we end up with all this turmoil in the middle. Uh, most, of the, most of the divides in Washington uh, are those in power and those who are not, not left and right, those in power against everyone else. And so we have, as Rennell pointed out, we have the fake fights, the false choice, and everything leads to what? fundraising for political campaigns, wedge issues to run campaigns on and, and gain more power. Uh, and ultimately, that's a we the people problem. And uh, I think that creates a downward spiral. Yeah. We continue to be more separated and, and more distant and lack of respect and contempt for the other side. I think part of it, too, is as human beings, we're emotional people. You know, we have a whole spectrum of emotions we go through each and every day. This is a way to, to uh, I guess, direct those emotions in a negative way against the opposition. And, uh, you know, clearly, uh, as we see taking place, and I think it's um, not as bad at the local level, not as bad at the state level, and, and a lot worse on, on the national level. And, and with people being anonymous anymore, social media, you know, the, the look at the comment section in the newspapers, if you dare. You don't, you don't read those, do you? No, I don't. In fact, my <laughs> staff kept them away from me. But thank you, Jason. Good staffing. That's um, good staffing. But, but it was just, I mean, even the newspapers, I remember talking to Dean Singles of the, the Salt Lake Tribune, and he had no idea what the comments were being said. 
and they were making making comments about him. Some actually used his name as if he was making the comments. Uh -huh. There was no ability to track, and you know people are very mean when they're anonymous. So social media is another aspect of this that uh, I think is hard for us to to understand. Uh, Rennell, this is this is an area of your area of expertise and what you studied as well. Uh, so, so get to this idea that we've all just been talking about here and what happens in these social media groups. Uh, and some of them are even private. You know, we don't even know all of that. Just people that think the same way, talking to other people that think the same way. As you've surveyed what's happened in this space, uh, any is there any light that you've seen here? Some recommendations or thoughts that you've had about how you kind of break out of those areas where you're kind of just in a position where you need to hear the other side a little bit? Yeah, I suppose I have um, a platform level recommendation and a people level recommendation. The people level recommendation um, mirrors the sorts of things that Boyd's been saying to us, uh, that uh, people need to make an individual self-assessment about whether uh, they are exploring ideas and principles and policies outside their own um, initial preferences. The, um, you know, the brain chemistry data tells us really clearly that we are all susceptible to it. Uh, everybody's really eager to say that the other folks are susceptible to it, and it's more difficult to acknowledge that you yourself might be susceptible to it and to try uh, to expose yourself to a wider array of um, media inputs than you currently are exposed to. On the platform level, I actually think the very first most important step towards solutions here is to get more transparency mm -hmm. from some of the largest social media uh, platforms about um, what actually is happening there, uh, what the ways in which their human and algorithmic content decisions impact us. I think a lot of folks don't know exactly um, why things show up in their feeds, um, why uh, the, the sort of pattern of engagement that they uh, have online uh, produces them um, the information that it produces and pushes them towards extremes that they might not otherwise have engaged in. Um, and, and part of this is because um, big platforms like Facebook haven't made that kind of data available to journalists and researchers who are interested in exploring those consequences. And being able just to have the information, uh, a first step, a good first step would be learning how this new media landscape does in fact impact our public discourse, how decisions are being made that impact us in ways that um, aren't perfectly transparent to us uh, could be a really important first step to solving some of the problems or at least having the right kinds of conversations about how to solve the problems in uh, public communications today. Mm -hmm. uh, Governor, it's, it's, uh, these are just such interesting points and it, it makes me wonder a little bit, uh, as we say, you need to expand the, the net and you need to start looking at other places and, and try to make us so, uh, there are ways for us not to just get fed what I want, the ultimate in, in confirmation bias uh, that I already have, but it makes me wonder whether or not the system right now is, the way it's the way it's working there's even a benefit like for you to be that person that's doing that that is elected official I mean, is there any reward i mean if it's really just fear and anger that drives people like renell was talking about a second ago and that's what we're being fed is i mean can, can you win can you be the uh, the elected official that wins if you don't engage in it well i think you can uh i think the old adage birds of a feather flock together mm -hmm. is a pertains here was people kind of find their little groups and somebody emerges as the leader and they like that and say hey come one come all uh, I think it's a lot easier than having to think if we can get an emotional charge that you're, you're the enemy it's us versus them and we're gonna win at all costs we justify what we do the end justifies the means and that's a lot easier than having to debate on the intellectual side and actually re think and reason on pros and cons of what actually would be good policy that's good for everybody, all Americans, not just for our side to, to win and plant the flag of triumph. So I think it is possible. I think actually in Utah we do a probably a much better job than other parts of the country, but we are we're following the trend, mm -hmm. and and we need to be careful. And it, by the way, the, the division is not just left or right; it's left, left, left. It's right, 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 and we have people say that there's three or four Republican parties now in Utah, maybe two or three Democrats, there's not as many Democrats, but the divisions are subtle but are real. Mm -hmm. and, and if somebody picks up the flag and says, follow me, and, so, and, and we just get more and more divided. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in our last couple of minutes we have, I, I really want people to watch this show and they go to have their, their dinners and they're hanging out with family to have some kind of guide, some 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 
ideas about how they can have these very difficult conversations because it's clear from this conversation we need to keep having them and it might not be the easiest thing to have them. Boyd, a couple thoughts for people about how to model civic dialogue. I think one of the first things you have to do is uh, avoid instant certainty. Uh, once I decide I'm right and you're wrong, the conversation is essentially over. Uh, you should also keep in mind just because you can say something does not mean you should say something. So we, we do want our, our freedom of speech to be sure, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. And you don't have to argue every point. Uh, let it go. And, and another great rule is if you must speak, ask a question. Uh, not a sarcastic question, uh, a real question, and then be willing to listen to the response. Uh, and it changes the tone, it changes it, and what we have to realize, the uh, governor pointed this out so well, we have so much in common. Uh, the vast majority of people have so much in common. Uh, we waste so much time on extreme issues by extreme people on extreme measures, uh, where the vast majority of the, of the country really want to have a different kind of conversation. Uh, they don't quite know how to ask for it or where to look for it. Mm -hmm. It's not going to show up in a Pew Research poll, but when they experience it, it's like oxygen. And it's like, yeah, I want to be part of that. And I think the vast majority of people around your dinner table, around your Thanksgiving table, uh, you can find it. You, you have to look a little harder uh, and you got to be a little more open to, am I willing to question my own ideas? Am I willing to consider for a minute I might be wrong, heaven forbid? Uh, if you're willing to do that, ask questions, listen, not have that instant certainty, uh, it creates a completely different dynamic for an elevated dialogue. If we, if we have some of these principles in mind when we're together this weekend, it allows not just for us to understand the issues better, understand our families and our friends well, a little we better. Are, well. It's Thanksgiving. Let's think about all the things we're thankful yes. for. <laughs> That's right, Governor. some common ground there. <laughs> and let's say, talk about things we're thankful for. And, and really, we've got a lot of great things to be, in fact, grateful That's for. True. And Th we're blessed people. As always, you get the last word, Governor. <laughs> thank you all for your comments tonight. And thank you for watching The Hinkley Report. This show is also available as a podcast on pbsutah.org slash Hinkley Report or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next week.